So we're in the middle of a sermon series called uh, Simplify. Now this series is for all of us whose life is probably uh, a little bit too complex. Now I don't think that any of us would say that our life is too simple. I think that many of us would say that our life uh, is too complex. Um, Now during these uh, four weeks, what we're trying to do is erase three words from our vocabulary. The three words are overscheduled, overwhelmed, and uh, exhausted. So think about that. I mean, have you used those words or have you thought about using those words like overextended, uh, overwhelmed, uh, exhausted? I think, that, uh, I think that many of us have. Now, last week we looked at the part uh, about exhausted. You know, like think about tired, think about worn out. I know that you've used those words before because I've heard you use them. You know, how's it going? We say, well, I'm tired, I'm worn out. Um, now, think about this. Like, when we're rested, when we're replenished, when we're renewed, this is when we're going to make the best choices in life. When we're rested and renewed and replenished, this is when we're going to pray our best prayers. This is when we're going to love other people the best. This is when we're going to love and be loved by God the best. Now, think about the opposite. Think about those times in your life when you're empty. Think about those times in your life when you're depleted. Now, this is when we don't make our best decisions, is it? It's not always the times when we're uh, patient and kind with other people. It's not always those times when we're uh, you know, really, really close with God. Um, being empty and depleted for too long is not, first of all, it's not God's plan for our life. And second of all, it's very dangerous. You know, we can get stuck in this rut and... Um, you don't want to get stuck in that rut. There's a better way to live. There really is. So we looked last week at taking responsibility for our own personal renewal. I'm not responsible for your renewal. Your spouse is not responsible for your renewal. Your parents are not responsible for your renewal. You are responsible for your own personal renewal. Now, there's certain things that we can do. We can rest. You can say no to some activity and you can rest. You know, if you're tired, you can actually say no to something so you can get some rest. Uh, You can relate to God. You can uh, enjoy life-giving relationships with other people. You can play. You can pray. You can do all those things. Um, Last week, we looked at the power of uh, a one-word sentence, and that one-word sentence is no. You You can say no, and no is a complete sentence. You do not have to explain your priorities to anybody else. We looked uh, uh, at saying no to some good things or some mediocre things so we can say yes to the best things. And really, I I talked about the two most powerful, you know, the two most powerful uh, tools in your spiritual life are going to be a calendar and a chair. Like, if you've set an appointment with me, you know what I do. I take out my calendar. I'll say, hey, I'm going to meet with Matt uh, at 10 o'clock on Monday. And he knows that for one hour, it's just going to be me and him, nobody else. We're going to talk, we're going to listen, we're going to pray, we're going to hang out. You know, it's got to be that way with God. If we don't get that on our calendar, uh, our calendar is going to fill up with other stuff. You know, it, it all comes down to uh, faith, really. You know, we talked about this last week as well. That uh, we, Say if you use like 15 or 20 minutes, say you use 20 minutes. And the faith is that you can do more as balanced and rested and focused and renewed and connected to God in three, uh, 23 hours and uh, 40 minutes than you can do in 24 hours by yourself. So you're saying, you know, God, I actually trust that when I put this on my calendar and I sit in this chair, that something's going to happen that I don't fully understand, but I'm going to do it anyway. Because I'm tired of this complex stuff. I'm tired of being overextended. I'm tired of being overwhelmed. I'm tired of uh, being worn down. That is a really cool sermon. If you miss it, you can listen to it. I explained it. You know, it took me 35 minutes last week. I just explained it in three. So uh, I'm getting a whole lot more efficient. But uh, So uh, today we're going to talk about um, two things that all of us deal with pretty much all the time. Um, really, there's probably not many days to go by that we don't deal with finances in some way. And then uh, for most of us, and if you're still in school, I want you to replace the word work with school because... I realize this is your life right now, but some of the same challenges you have as a middle school student or a high school student is the same issues that we deal with with, uh, later in life. So we're dealing with uh, uh, work and we're dealing with finances. 
Now, I want to give you two words that are going to make your life really complex. Now, these two words can really mess up your life. Now, these words are not good words. Um, You know, they're not like swear words or anything, but these words will have a devastating effect when we uh, actually practice these words. The first word is uh, envy. And the second word is comparison. Now, as I talk about work and as I talk about finances, we have to start here. You know, these things will mess you up. Like, seriously, they will. Like, you start to compare yourself or what you have to somebody else. Um, Yeah, good luck. You're going to lose that one. You know, it's like, it's not even fair. You're not even doing it right. Because, like, as a pastor, I've learned over the last 20 years that things are not uh, quite as neat and tidy as they appear by looking at the front of a house or at someone's Facebook wall. You know, we compare ourselves to who we perceive other people are, not even who they actually are. You know, and the envy has all sorts of problems. Um, you know, we become envious of someone's car, their house, uh, a relationship they have or whatever. The minute that we become envious of somebody else, it's going to be impossible to be grateful for what we have. The moment that we become envious of somebody and what they have is the simultaneous moment that it becomes impossible for us to love that person. You know, so as we go down this journey of finances and work, I want us to think about envy and comparison and the devastating effects that they can have on us. Now, there's a word that we can replace um, uh, with envy. There is, and that word is called gratitude. And I want you to just think about this for yourself. Do you want to spend the rest of your life being envy, envious, or, or do you want to spend the rest of your life being grateful? I think we're going to choose grateful, aren't we? And uh, do you want to spend uh, the rest of your life comparing? Or do you want to spend the rest of your life as content? Yes, you know, so I think it would be really cool today if we could con- trade in uh, envy and comparison for these uh, these virtues, th- this grace that's really called uh, uh, contentment and gratitude. Now, the first thing that a simple person, a person who embraces the simple life, is going to say um, regarding our finances is this. Everything that I have is a gift, and it comes from the hand of a loving God. Now, for those of us who can embrace simplicity in our finances, we have to start there. That everything I have, everything no exceptions, comes as a gift uh, from the hand of a loving God. Now, you know, some of you might think, you know, Craig, (laughs) I've worked really hard, and I've pretty much gotten where I've gotten by myself. I say, no, you haven't. You didn't, like, you weren't there. I mean, you were there, but you didn't create your own birth. That's a gift to you, and it's from God. It's called life. You all those teachers and coaches and mentors that that, uh, educated and inspired and informed you, that's a gift. You know, your intelligence, your creativity, that's a gift. Now, I know that some of you have worked hard, and I don't want to belittle that because I know your schedule, and I know the things you've said no to, and I know the sacrifices that you've made. But I think any one of us here, we we have to agree, um, if we have any humility at all, that everything we have is given to us by the hand of a loving God. Now, James chapter 1, verse 17 says, Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father. He says everything, everything that is good and perfect is a gift. It's a, it's a gift from God. Now, we move to the second step. The second step, and this is going to be a big one for many of us. The second step is like this. I'm going to joyfully live within God's current provision for my life. Now, the person that is going to practice simplicity with their personal finances is going to be able to say that. That I'm going to live joyfully and with contentment at the current situation that I have, the current provision, God's current provision in my life. Now, uh, discontentment, you know, when we're not able to do this, discontentment, it's going to cause all sorts of problems. And we're going to get into one of those in just a few minutes. Contentment with our finances, it's going to allow us to live much simpler. 
So let's go back to uh, the verse that uh, Liz read just a little bit ago. This is Paul. He's writing in uh, Philippians chapter 4. Now, about Paul, we have to know that at one time, you know, Paul was pretty wealthy. He was a Pharisee. He was educated. He would have been a community leader. He would have had a lot. We also know that Paul gave up everything uh, to follow Christ. So there was a day that Paul started over and he had nothing. So this is the guy that writes what I'm about to read. In verse 11, and he uh, says, Not that I was ever in need, um, for I have learned how to be content. Listen to what he says. I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. It's like back in those days when I pretty much had more than enough, I was content. On that day when I picked myself up after God knocked me down and I started walking to uh, Damascus with nothing, I was content. I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it's a full stomach or an empty stomach, with plenty or with little. Now, the verse I'm going to read next, um, many of you would say that this is your favorite Bible verse. If I would ask you what your favorite Bible verse is, you'd say, yeah, it's Philippians uh, 4.13. Do you guys know what that is? Anybody? For I can do all things through God who gives me strength, or through Christ who gives me strength. So your favorite Bible verse is written in this context. The Paul says, yeah, I've learned how to be content when I've had a lot. I've learned how to be content when I have very little. I've gotten by when my stomach is full. I've gotten by uh, when my stomach is empty. And I can do everything. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So he's saying, yeah, you can do this. If you're poor, you can be content. If you're rich, you can be content. If you're in the middle, you can be in content. If you're debt, you can, uh, in debt, you can be content. Um, you can do this through Christ who gives you strength. Now, um, I do want to talk about uh, debt. Um, and really, uh, you know, just, just what this is. Um, so let's... Uh, basically, debt is not, you know, so I said, like, God has, like, a, a current level of provision for your life. It's where you are right now. You know, sometimes it might be up here, or sometimes it might be kind of down here. Most of us is kind of, you know, pretty steady. But debt is basically saying, okay, God, uh, you want to provide for me at this level. But debt is saying, okay, God, you actually messed up on this one because uh, this is not my current level of provision. So I'm going to do what I can do to have this be my new current level of provision. So, you know, the accountant and the financial planner, they may give you a little bit different picture of debt, and they come from a different perspective. But as a theologian, like debt, it's not trusting in God's current level of provision. I don't have enough, so I'm going to go and borrow more. Um, now, this one is, uh, is going to mess you up. Um, you know, debt is going to leave. I mean, we talk about, like, uh, it leads to slavery is what it leads to. You become a slave to the banks and the people that you owe money to. You have to work too hard. You have to work too much. Um, there's always this burden that you owe somebody something. The slavery will lead to shame, and the shame will lead to this place where we are overwhelmed. And when we're overwhelmed, all of a sudden, life isn't simple anymore, is it? It's very complex. Um, you know, it, this, it's got to end. Like, it does. Uh, it's got to end for your children. It's got to end for your children's children. Like, some of you are so far out of debt, um, and you're so grateful for that, that you could have tuned out the last three or four minutes, and I, I praise God for that. I really do. You know, the reason that I was able to stand up here and announce that we basically raised $425,000 on one weekend is because some of you don't know what I'm talking about right there, and I praise God for that. Now, some of you are thinking, okay... <laughs> I get this now. Um, you know, I am a slave to the credit card company. I'm a slave to this mortgage company where I'm so overextended. And, you know, it starts today. That's how you, you, know, you, you do this one step at a time, one day at a time. It starts today. You know, if you have to sell something, if you have to make a little bit more, if you have to give up something, you know, we do that. And I'm not really going to go into great detail on a Sunday morning, but we got two great opportunities as a church coming up. 
both these are going to be in your bulletin today. Uh, one of them is called Financial Peace University. This is like the basic 101 course, and you're going to learn how to get rid of debt and accumulate wealth and live according to God's financial plan for your life. Now, if you've taken Financial Peace, we're offering another class. This one's called uh, Financial Peace Legacy Journey. It's kind of like Financial Peace 2 or Financial Peace uh, 201. I could not encourage you to take these uh, enough. You know, these classes in our church have changed people's lives. All right, so alignment um, number three. Uh, the person who practices simplicity financially is going to be able to say, I honor God by giving the first tenth of all my earnings for his purposes in the world. If you really want to get to this place with simplicity and finances, you're going to be able to say, I honor God by giving a tenth of my income, the first tenth of my income, for his purposes in this world. Now, Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Here's where we get this from. Bring the whole tithe, this is the Hebrew word for a tenth, um, into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Then he says, test me on this, says the Lord God Almighty, and see if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. Okay, so whenever I talk about this, the room gets really quiet. Um, I'm a fairly intuitive person, and um, I can sense that. But I don't want you to feel guilty right now, okay? Let's just, let's right now declare this to be a guilt-free zone. Can we do that? And just start there, put this in the parking lot. We're not about guilt here, we're about grace here. And maybe we can find grace in Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Maybe God is trying to give us something here rather than take something away from us. Um, so let's just have uh, two conversations. Um, Both these people exist in our church. In fact, there's many of these people in this church and churches all over you. So you're going to say, okay, Craig, uh, I'm starting here at A, and I want to go to B. B means, like, I get to retire someday. B means that my kids get to go to college. B means that uh, I get to take a trip somewhere. So if I want to go from A to B, I need 100% of what I make. Now, you know what? If you actually plan that and execute it, guess what? You can probably get from A to B. Now, there's other people in the church that will say, okay, so God's level of provision is this. Um, But I really believe if uh, I start off and I read Malachi 3, verse 10, and I give God the first tenth of what I make, I actually still believe, in fact, it's not belief here, it's called faith, I have faith that God will give me from A to B. I believe that God can do with 90% what I can do with 100%. I have faith that this promise is true. Now, what's really, really interesting um, with this is if you start off like at the high A and you go to B, you'll probably get there. Now, if you start off with a little bit lower A and you got the same B, you're going to get there. But then, and this is where it becomes really cool, like as a pastor, as a theologian, as one who sees this happen, like this isn't something I learned in seminary. This is something I've observed and witnessed and experienced over the last 20 years of ministry. Something else is going to happen. See, in God's economy, it's different than our economy. God will say, okay, you give me that 10%, and I'll take you from A to B, but then I'm going to do something else. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take you to C. Now, let's read about this in Malachi 3.10. Um, you know, test me on this. Like, try it. Like, test me on this. Um, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. Now, C is the place of blessing. This is where our faith grows. This is where joy is experienced. This is where... Um, there's going to be less stress. This is where there's going to be uh, less envy. It's where where faith is going to be formed. Now, if you want to do the first thing and take 100%, you can go from A to B, but you're never going to get to C. Now, if we want to put God to the test on this and go from the lower A to the lower B, we're going to find that God takes us to C. Now, I've seen these stories. I've seen these stories for two decades I've seen these stories that say, you know, I'm going to put God first in all that I do. 
Just like I trust that God can do more in me in 23 hours and 40 minutes than I can do by myself in 24 hours, I'm going to trust that God can do more with 90% of my resources than I can do with 100. I believe that God is going to take me to see this special place that is only going to be coming through my faith. Now, um, you know, the, the interesting thing about this, uh, it's really interesting, like, say if you're up here, you think that the people down here are crazy. Like, you do, like, well, they're crazy, you know, you're giving 10%, you can't, like, get from A to B with 90%. But what's really interesting is, like, the people down here, they're like, these people are crazy up there. They might be able to get from A to B, but they can never get to C without giving that 10%. You know, the only thing I want you to think about with this um, is just that text from Malachi. I put God to the test. I have never in 20 years had someone come back to me and want their money back. I've never had anyone that's come and said, you know, Craig, you talked to me about tithing, and I actually fell for it. Um, you know, I'm going to stop. We can't do this anymore. It's not good. Never had that conversation, but I can tell you what I've had dozens of conversations that said, you know, Craig, we moved up gradually and we're at this place now and it's such a joy for us. It's a blessing. It's, it's doing wonders in our marriage. It's doing wonders with our parenting. Um, I'm receiving blessings now that I would have never received. Like, I've had a lot of those conversations. I would just say this, you know, God says put them to the test. Try it. Try it for a few months. Try it for a few weeks. Give it a shot. Um, if you can't do the whole thing, get part of the way there. Take some incremental steps. All right, number four. Um, this one's going to be critical as well. The person that uh, practices uh, simplicity in their finances, I will set aside a portion of my earnings into a savings account or an investment account for uh, emergencies, for retirement, for kids' education, uh, for later years in life. Now, um, here's the deal. Like, a financial winter is coming. Like, you know, you may stop working because you have to retire. Um, you, know, you may have some type of emergency or health crisis. The car may break down. It depends where you're at, but there's a financial winter that's coming. Now, if you think it's cold out today, uh, try to go through one of those financial winters. It's going to be nice out on probably Tuesday or Wednesday of this week. Um, the financial winter can be ruthless and relentless. Now, Proverbs chapter 6, verses uh, 6 through 8 uh, here, the Proverbs writer says, take a lesson from the ants. So think about like an ant here. Um, learn from their ways and become wise. They labor hard all summer, gathering food for the winter. So really what they're doing here is they're, you know, paying God first. And the second part is, you know, we pay ourselves. Um, now, uh, I always tell people like, and this is this way with finances, it's this way in so many areas of life. You can deal with some pain now, or you can deal with a whole lot of pain later in life. You know, to so, say no to some things now so you can retire later, like it's a little bit of pain now, but not having enough money later, that's going to be a whole lot of pain. You know, saying no to some things now so uh, we can put it in an emergency fund, and when the emergency happens, uh, you know, we're prepared for it. So, uh, I always tell people it's kind of like a quirky thing. Um, but how many hours a day, like, uh, do you typically work? Just typically, what would it be for most people? Good, I heard someone say eight. So, you know, some might be a little bit higher, some might be a little bit lower, but many people work like five, eight hour days, and there's a 40 hour work week, right? So basically, one third of most of our days is spent working. Now, how many, uh, how hours a day would you ideally sleep? So it'd be eight, right? Some people might be able to get by in a little bit less. Uh, some people might need a little bit more. So you got eight hours worth of uh, work. You got eight hours worth of sleep. So what does that give you? How many hours are left in a day? All you mathematicians out there. Good, so eight, right? So eight hours you get to basically like do the things that you love, uh, best case, you'll get to do the things that you love with the people you love. That's where life happens. Now, I know you got to go to the grocery store and do laundry and some of that stuff, but you know, basically we have eight hours a day where we should have at least some discretionary time. So I always tell people, um, like find some really cool friends and some really cool hobbies and enjoy life for one-third of your life. 
You go out to Nebraska Furniture Mart and buy a very comfortable bed because one-third of your life is going to be spent in this bed. And the th they laughed at that the first service. They thought it was funny. Um, <laughs> it was too cold out for y'all or what. Then, uh, the, last, uh, the last third, um, we work. You know, so find a job you love you know, with people that you uh, enjoy doing it with. So alignment number five is going to, we're going to shift from finances to work here. The two are very closely related, but the person that practices uh, simplicity with their work life, they can actually say, you know, I'm passionate um, about many of the things that I get to do in my life. So let me ask you a question. Um, who here, like, absolutely just has the perfect job? There's nothing about your job that's not perfect. You're well compensated. You love what you do all the time. You love everybody that you do it with. So we got uh, one guy over there at least. So most of us do not have a perfect job, do we? Now most of us, uh, well, let me ask you another question. Who here, like, you know, there's some intricacies to your job. There's some things that, you know, are tricky sometimes. But who here has a job that you're really passionate about? Like, raise your hand. You just love what you do. You get up and you can say, you know, I cannot wait to go to work. So, uh, you know, what passion is, is it, it's energy. Like, you ask yourself the question, like, what really fires you up? Um, you know, these passions, uh, they'll come from God. Now, okay, here's what I'm not suggesting. So there's like 80% of you that are not overly passionate about your job. Okay, so the desired outcome of this sermon is not to uh, create a resignation letter and give it to your boss tomorrow because the preacher said you're not passionate about your job. Um, our economy would collapse uh, if everyone believed that. Now, I do want to challenge you, though, okay? Um, I've dealt with people later in life, um, like I said, for the last 20 years. I spent a lot of my time in hospitals and nursing homes and around conference tables and funeral rooms. Um, I think it would be a great travesty if we went through life um, living a passionless life. So even if, like, your current situation doesn't allow you to leave your job because you got kids and you got bills and you got debt you're trying to pay off or you got a, a future that you're trying to finance. There still has to be something that's passionate in your life. There has to be something that you do with somebody that makes a difference that stirs you. You know, God did not create us to live a passionless life. So let me just give you a few examples of, uh, of how this works. Um, I told this story before about a friend of mine. I did her wedding 11 years ago. Her name's Paige. And uh, Paige used to be like this event coordinator. So she would put on these great big weddings. Um, you know, she liked doing it. I mean, she would start work like at you know, 9 o'clock on Thursday morning, pretty much goes through like midnight on Saturdays. Like it's a huge thing to be like the event coordinator for big weddings. And then she would do uh, the bar mitzvahs for uh, like Jewish kids who were like what, 13 or 14 or whatever. Like she would put these things on and they were like huge events. Now this was not her passion. Yeah, you know, she liked doing it. She saw some good in what she did. But uh, her passion is homeless people. Her dad is a Methodist pastor in uh, Oklahoma. Um, now gradually over time she shifted from the wedding stuff and the bar mitzvah stuff, um, to doing this new thing. Um, it's called the Birthday Party Project. Uh, you can like, look it up online. It's like birthdaypartyproject.com. She was actually on the Steve Harvey show this week, the guy that does Family Feud and can't get the Miss America or Miss Universe right or whatever. Um, so like the Birthday Party Project now is like in 15 or 17 cities throughout the country. And her passion is being lived out. What, what's happening is all these homeless kids who would never get a birthday party are now getting a birthday party because of her passion. You know, it wasn't enough to make money and, you know, have happy brides and happy grooms and happy kids. You know, her passion was to help these homeless kids, and she's doing the skill set that she had with the passion that she had. She mixed these two things together, and this incredible thing is happening throughout the country. Now, that's not going to be most of our story, is it? Like, things like this happen once in a while, and I hope that something like this happens you know, in this room. But for many of us, uh, yeah, it's going to look a little bit different. Like, I got this other buddy. He's, uh, he lives here in town, and um, he's an accountant by day. So he, you know, balances numbers and 
gets information and computes it and all that sort of stuff. Uh, he doesn't dislike his job. He doesn't dislike his coworkers. But uh, when he gets off work, he goes straight home. He's got like this uh, gym down in his basement. And like he's got a 5.30 slot and a 6.30 slot and a 7.30 slot and a 8.30 slot. And uh, he'll train people like for an hour. And he just loves to see their transformation. You know, they eat their supplements and they drink their muscle milk and, you know, lift their kettlebells. And that's what he loves. He loves doing it. Like he wakes up in the morning, he goes to work, and he gets off work, and he cannot wait to get home because he gets to do something he loves. Now, this is what life is about, doing something that you love. You know, uh, I used to coach soccer. You guys remember those stories? Like, I coached soccer for a long time, and I knew you all missed the soccer story, so I got a soccer story for you. Um, I was coaching against this one guy. Like, most of the coaches I would usually coach against were, like, in their 20s, like, from the U.K., and they talked really funny and cool and all that kind of stuff. Or, like, dads like me that just knew enough to be dangerous, and, you know, we did our best. Now, this guy was probably around 60 or so, and um, he had all the soccer gear, like the black uh, thing with the three stripes down the side and the soccer shoes and all the really, uh, really cool kind of stuff. And... I could tell that this man, like, just did an exceptional job with these kids. Now, don't worry, my, to- my team still beat his. I mean, that's not the point of the story. But uh, <laughs> I could just tell, like, he loved them. I could tell that they respected him. I could tell that as a team, um, they just had this figured out. So what's, uh, I went up to him afterward. I said, you know, you do a really good job. Um, you do a really good job with these kids. Is your, like, son on the team? The kid kind of laughed, and he says, yeah, usually people ask me if it's my grandson that's on the team, but uh, he says, you know, I'm an engineer. I design stuff from uh, 7 o'clock in the morning to 4 o'clock in the afternoon. He says, I cannot wait for March to come every year. I cannot wait for August to come every year because I get to invest in this next generation. Yeah, I get to do what I love. And you just looked at him, and you could tell that he was doing what he loved, and you could tell that what he loved was making a difference in the lives of these kids and these families. Like, this is stuff that we can do here. This is stuff that we can do here. We got, uh, you know, a woman in our church. Uh, she loves to cook, and she loves helping people, and she put together this ministry that uh, now as a church, we're able to create meals and make meals for, uh, like, right now, I think we're serving four or five families. Like, we have two or three families that are going through cancer and another that's uh, recovering from surgery, and now as a church, like, we can help people out that are going through these incredibly tough times because this woman is passionate about food, and she's passionate about helping people. She put the two together, and now there's being, you know, food delivered all over West Omaha because of this vision. Like, this is how this stuff works. Now, uh, the last uh, adjustment that we're going to look at, the last thing, number six, um, for the one that's really going to embrace simplicity in life, um, you know, we're doing what we're passionate about. um, But number six is going to be, we're going to be a positive influence in our culture at work. So, like, if you're a student here, you have a culture. If you're a teacher here, there's a different culture. If uh, you work at Union Pacific, that's going to be a different culture. If you work at Methodist Hospital, that's going to be a different culture. If you work at some uh, advertising agency, that's going to be a different culture. We all have different cultures. Um, There's a woman I know in the church. She runs uh, an organization, and every once in a while, I go speak to her employees. And like she says every time, Craig, just be fun. Like, make make them laugh. Just like, have this just be a time that they, I'm trying to create a culture here, and she says this, I'm trying to create a culture here where people just want to come to work, where it's a fun place. That's one type of culture. Yeah, I played golf with another guy this summer, and like it was a Tuesday or Wednesday, I think, and he says, gosh, I could not wait to get out here. I just hate going into work. I go in there, and I'm just on pins and needles the whole time. Everybody else is. Um, You know, that's a whole different type of culture altogether. Now, you can be one of two people at your school. You can be one of two people at your workplace. You can be a culture buster or a culture builder. Do any of you at your workplaces have uh, culture busters? Anybody? That they just kind of like bring everybody down? Um, Yeah, we get those, don't we? But we also are blessed to have culture builders in our life. And I want to challenge us um, to be culture builders. You know, one of the ways that we can simplify our life and a lot of, a lot of other people's life is to uh, have a lot more simple culture at work. You know, we, where we don't compete, but we collaborate. Um, you know, where we're not practicing things like uh, envy and uh, comparison. 
but we're doing things like uh, contentment and gratitude. Now, when you go to your office tomorrow, when you go to your workplace tomorrow, when you go to your school tomorrow, you can start, you can take this long, it's a long process, but you can start, take the next step uh, in making your life and a lot of other people's lives a whole lot more simple.